It's an endo meeting. It's May 3rd. Okay, I have, a, I have a silly little endo related demo to show. Um, this is my web page, which is a fork of someone else's web page. Um, it is a little desktop emulator UI. The font is too tiny. What about, what about now? I made it bigger. How about this? Okay, I think the, the font I was complaining about was on the panel on the right, which is probably oh, okay. the panel. Yeah, you shouldn't need to worry about that one. Okay, um, yeah, the, stuff, the stuff on the left is, is way more than big enough. Fantastic. Um, let me... Let me try to open something off the screen if I can. <laughs> nope. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> um good this one over there too that one's not sensitive okay so um you, i can do two things with this silly silly little thing i can um i can take a i can just drag a file on there and that works um and then what i added last night is I can take an IPFS hash and mount it. Sir, could you give us a little bit more orientation about what kind of thing that this is? Or yeah, this is this is just the extra stuff right now. This is a browser or an operating system emulator in the browser, um, and so you can drag and drop files onto it. And I just mounted an IPFS directory. Oh, and it exploded. Um, and so, because I want access to this file, which is a .agar endo archive. Um, so most of this was already built in, uh, this, this operating system emulator thing. And the th primary thing I added was uh, a runtime for endo archives. And so I found a uh, React calculator sort of hello world app and through endo at it and with only a couple of tweaks uh was able to get it running and so this is running inside an iframe and it um it's since it's not it's running inside of endo but since there's no limited access to globals there's no policy in this version um it just uh, gets access to the DOM and is able to render it. And since it's in an iframe, it seems okay for now. Um, but yeah, it, it works and it's a real, uh, it's a real archive. Like I can rename it and to a zip. Then we can open it up and see all the, the files inside that make up the application. And so yeah. that was fun. So, um, so the way that you got it to work in the browser environment was by delegating the iframes global this to the compartment mapper? Yes. Hmm. Um, from inside the iframe. Um, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so there's a, you, you created an endo runtime that runs in an iframe and delegates all of the iframes global into the, into the underlying application. Yeah. Uh, and then I needed um, transforms for the source repo in order to convert the JSX syntax. Um, mm -hmm. and, and then I also added one for CSS files uh, because it's common in the React ecosystem to just import a CSS file. Um, uh, added it, made it so it, it wraps a CSS file in, in a head, document head insert mm -hmm. wrapper. And it worked. With the combination of the iframe and eventually with a combination of a policy, this seems like a reasonably, this seems like a good compromise, um, like a, a very a very lava modi compromise on isolation of a, of a web application. Yeah. Um, 
Right. I didn't I didn't need to do anything special for Endo to tell it it was a web app. It just got access to a browser environment. Okay. So I might I might have missed something because I, I got distracted for a moment. But uh, in terms of uh, of web apps and and isolation of them, uh, what about the DOM? Um, in this case, if for the runtime of, uh, that's, I built on top of Endo, I give it full access to the iframes DOM. Okay. Um, because we don't have a policy generator yet that's yeah, compatible and, with the policies in Endo. Okay. But I mean, it's, it's not just, um, a policy, I mean, to, to, give authority to contain authority to the dom to give authority to let's say a subtree of the dom um is you know still a interesting problem that we have oh yeah okay yeah that wasn't part of this project this was this was basically if i if i take a random react project off of github can i get it in an endo compartment and can i get it to run and the mm -hmm. answer is yeah needed okay. just a little bit of massaging okay that's great that's really great and yeah i wasn't i wasn't advocating that we need to take on the dom i just wanted clarity yeah so this doesn't provide so so what this does is it runs application with all of the an application with all of the authority granted by whatever iframe you give it which is extensive but with policies you'll be able to do a better audit of what it's actually doing. Um, yeah, you'll be able to, so the, the, the objective with Lava Moat in general is to limit, is to reduce the blast radius of third-party dependencies. And in this, you have essentially a web application running in from an archive, which is interesting in and of itself, because that means that this is a distributable, integrity checkable web page essentially um this is this is fantastic progress yeah this my my hope for an endo application is eventually to get this far except make uh like on the way to this to provide um on the way to this to be able to provide actual isolation of some or all of the endo application um but having like, like there's there isn't yeah there's a there's a huge step between full isolation and a reasonable api for an application and the arbitrary expressiveness of the web um and still being isolated <laughs> um this is this is cool I, yeah I think I, it's, <laughs> If anything, this validates the design of the compartment mapper, um, if and if, if nothing else. I, I was wondering if uh, we could get it at um, before it runs for the first time uh, to ask to like look at the policy and ask you you know aggregate the policy into one one blob and say like do you want to allow it to have access to these things. But we need a policy generator first. Yeah, the policy, the lava mo the yeah, the, this the, there are two layers, right? There's uh, what do you ask the user to grant, and then also what does the what do the third party modules ask of the application? And I think that the policies correspond to that, and then the application as a whole asks for any any authority that any of its third party dependencies actually require which is like if you were to if you were to present if you were to present a uh, a proposal to to run an application based off of its policy it would be interesting to an auditor how those authorities get distributed to third party modules but as an end user, you're effectively granting the application every authority that any piece of it requires. Yeah, yeah.
Anyways, uh, fun little experiment. That's excellent. Did you want to talk a bit about your um, your proposal for uh, new kinds of bundles or new new kinds of um, a new mechanism for confinement based off of parsing? Sure. Um, yeah, and we need we should do a write up of the version that Markham was discussing yesterday i'm pulling up the issue yeah and uh one, one request i have for everybody in the discussion is never refer to global unqualified always refer to realm global uh or compartment global where realm global is the same as the start compartment global so by compartment global i mean Constructed compartment global, not globals other than the realm global. And we should also be specific about whether we talk about global scope or global objects. That's true too. Yes. Global properties. Right. Global properties. Okay. So this is an idea that I'm sure has been had before. But it was the idea of doing sandboxing a different way um, using code generation. And one of the advantages of this is we could run in strict mode uh, because we do not need a with statement and we do not need a proxy. Um, there's some environments where we're, with statement is not available like Hermes uh, for React Native. And there's um, some situations where the, the slow path of using with statement may be prohibitive. Um, so I think this might be a nice option. Um, I'm going to pull out the, the uh, I'll do that at the end, actually. Um, does, does Hermes um, omit not just the with statement, but omit all of sloppy mode? I don't think they omit sloppy mode. They just didn't implement the with statement. Okay. Um, yeah, so the the main idea here is that by doing some code generation, uh, doing some static analysis on the untrusted code, and then doing some code generation that wraps that code, uh, we can uh, achieve some sandboxing uh, with a couple constraints, uh, but the nice one nice part of it is that you don't need to transform the internal code other than just wrapping it. Um, so we identify all utterances. Uh, how else would we refer to this? Syntactic references? I like the word utterance. I have not yeah. seen that before for this purpose, but I think it's it's very clear and it's it doesn't overlap with some existing usage that's somewhat different. So it's, I think it's great. Yeah, and, and just to clarify, I'm talking about um, identifiers, some some references to a thing directly that are that's not via a property or something like this. So it's just what okay. it's declared, so, when it says a variable, that's okay. that's an utterance. So given that you're um, uh, doing a, you know, get, you know, under the scenario where you're doing a full parse and able to do a static analysis according to the, to the language's static rules, um, uh, if you wanted a narrower, a, you know, a, a narrower but still adequate list, uh, the right term is uh, free variables. In other words, uh, if there's a uh, utterance of a variable name that's clearly already bound to a declaration in scope, uh, then it's not a free variable and it need not be uh, in your list of uh, utterances that you need to shadow. So that would be the, the narrowest form of just, and, and that for that, the right term is just free variables. Great, yeah, so th that's what we're looking for. We're looking for free variables. And the nice thing is we, we, we need to capture all the free variables, but if we overshoot and we capture some other things that aren't, um, then we're great. So we can be a little uh, conservative in the sense that if we take too many um, uh, utterances, then it's still 
we we achieve security and we shouldn't impact anything else. Okay, and this, um, the the terrifying thing. I just want to the terrifying thing about doing this with parsing and then not rewriting, but just preserving the original source text uh, is that if your parse is not accurate, if the machine that then interprets the source parses differently than your parser did, uh, uh, you can completely lose security. And, there and uh, we've had that experience in the old Google Kaha where we were uh, at one point uh, depending on um, uh, de depending on the Acorn parser to identify variables. And we had a security break with somebody using the HTML like comment um, in a way that was different than the, um, than the Acorn parser thought the rules were for the HTML like comment. And they got a complete security break by doing that. And then the other thing is that this obviously has to completely forbid or censor direct eval, right? Yes. Yeah, this, the idea is that this would be the implementation of a functor or set of functors for a compartment. And the we need to, so if we use the existing mechanism for preparing a compartments global list, um, we can reuse that here. Uh, I'm sorry, which, which existing mechanism? I, don't, I didn't understand that. Yeah, the the global uh, compartment global this dot eval. Oh 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 right, because the um, because the, the that eval protects against direct eval. Um, well, it's actually it's it's. Um, wait a second, the existing mechanism uses with. So I think I got a lost orientation on the which we're. Uh, yeah to. yeah. So the. I'm actually going to get at a proposal of how we could maybe support further evals, um, but because this is done through code generation, um, I, I guess I wasn't primarily thinking of supporting eval, though it is possible to support it. Um, my, you know, my primary use case is um, uh, applications that already have all their modules set out and they're not doing. Um, eval at runtime, but of course that's a, a feature we want to support as well. Oh, 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 that's interesting. The If you depend on parsing, then supporting direct eval um, uh, uh, creates a problem. If you do the other non-parsing technique uh, that, that I raised, which is uh, which depends on the realm global, being non-extensible and then and then just shadowing all properties defined on the realm global, uh, then inside the evaluated code, direct eval is not a problem. Um, indirect eval would be a problem, and you can't make eval, you can't enable direct eval without enabling indirect eval, since you have to make the original eval function available. That's all very interesting. Yeah, that is that's that's a change. Um, so yes, uh, for now I'm going to say that we just disable eval, and then I'll uh, discuss ways we might enable it okay. um, for this proposal. Okay. Um, so one thing we need to do is we need to set up our global this so that uh, both bare global properties um, and prop properties on the global this, compartment global this are synchronized. And so we can do that with a getter and setter pointing to the bearer variable that we so we, we need to generate so these. I don't believe you can, or rather you, if, if, if once there's multiple modules or you have multiple source units that mention the same assignable variable, that this technique can no longer work. Uh, I do I do handle multiple modules, um, and so I'll, I'll I'll get to those. I'm just talking about the setup of the global this. And okay, and when you say global this, let me make sure that we compartment understand global this. Yes, thank you. 
Um, and yeah, so so I'm uh, carrying around this this sandbox kit reference uh, to help uh, set up all these things, and so I remove access to that just before running the untrusted code. Uh, so here we're setting up the global properties and the global the the compartment global this object. We deny the internal kit, um, and then we run the untrusted code. Mm -hmm. Um, oh, so here I'm starting to differentiate between uh, endowments and global utterances or free variables. Um, these, we only need to set up uh, these and these for the free variables. And for the non-free variable endowments, we can just dump them into the compartment global this without setting up uh, these um, refer aliases. I don't know what you want to call them. Uh, I, so I, I, I didn't understand that. If they're sure. So if if a compartment is given the properties X Y Z and A B C. And ABC is only referenced via global this dot ABC, but XYZ is referenced bare as just XYZ. Then we need to set up some sort of like aliasing between global this dot XYZ and XYZ. Okay. Um, so, so, okay. So this, this is again presuming the, uh, the uh, an a, a accurate enough parser so that you know that XYZ is actually mentioned as a variable. That is the assumption of this whole scheme is that you can do that. Okay. Okay. Um, so but you're allowed to you're allowed to overshoot and take too many. Okay. Good. Um, uh, so if an endowment overlaps with a variable, then you have to do this aliasing trick. Uh, you have so, yes. Okay. So what if multiple modules? Um, cool. I'm getting to, I'm getting to multiple modules, so I will get there next. Okay. 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 Um, yes, actually, it's the next one right here. Uh, I'm not sure the best way to do this, but if you want to do multiple evaluations and you knew what they were ahead of time, you could do something along these lines, where you do all the setup once, and then you have different sections where you would put the different modules, so they have their own evaluation scope oh. um and then you you might want to like you know return or like uh make available a function or like make this an array of functions or something like this wait, wait, um, wait. um wait um so okay so you're assuming that if you have multiple modules that your rewriter is going to turn them into one contiguous source. Uh, that is that is a requirement, yeah. That's for the okay the, for the kind of fidelity that I want here, yeah. Okay, okay. This is um, this is flowing from you being in the space of building a secure bundler on top of the compartment mapper, if I'm not mistaken. So creating a creating a, essentially a roll up, a concatenation of all of the working set is table stakes and enabling the eva the evaluation of future modules is not a goal like dynamic. yeah yeah that's that's an important uh point yeah my, my perspective is here creating a bundle i already have all the modules laid out i just need to put them in the right place um so this this is straightforward however there might be a way to do um further eval which is we just need to put an e we just we need to do some things including putting an eval statement inside of the scope and then uh you need to do uh there's something i didn't diagram here where you like set up a new safe eval inside the eval um but uh basically Further research required. <laughs> Don't hold me accountable to this this part. Yeah. So uh, something that folks on the call 
might not know, having not been on the relevant reviews, is that uh, I believe Aaron and ZB have both discovered or discovered together, I don't know, um, that within the architecture of the compartment mapper, the, um, the most straightforward way to generate a bundle from an application is to first do all of the work that's already implemented for generating an archive, because that does all of the renaming and isolation and basically just produces a compartment map and a, and a, and a map of file paths that are exactly what you need in order to generate a bundle from, um, from all of that stuff. So that's, uh, that's the direction they're taking. Um, okay. And yeah, I, I suppose that that's obvious in retrospect. Let, let me let me inject a note of caution on anything that's doing rewriting. Um, the uh, so so we've we're doing our own re so first of all, uh, uh, you know, other rewriters out there in the world are not ones where we can vouch that they preserve our security because what they consider to be semantics preserving. Uh, does not include the, the semantics that our security depends on. Um, so we've done our own uh, safe uh, rewriter for purposes of turning modules into valuable strings. And from a software development point of view, right now, because of a bug in Babel, it has been an unmitigated disaster, um, uh, simply because uh, uh, you, you can, if you tell Babel to preserve original layout, it will preserve line numbers, which is great, but it will completely screw up horizontal white space, uh, which means that uh, in the debugger, what you're looking at uh, is just not readable code. Uh, you're losing all the indentation and everything. So it's, it's, it's just been a miserable, miserable debugging experience. I just can't, can't emphasize how bad that is. Um, uh, if, uh, one of the things that um, is exciting to me, if I understand this correctly, is uh, under some restrictions, you could act, you you can actually um, uh, not rewrite, just analyze, uh, or even in the um, the alternate um, uh, non-extensible realm global. Uh, uh, thing not even analyzed, but let's say you analyze. As long as you don't rewrite you, and not pass in through Babel, then you could preserve the original sources. You, you know, all of your prefix and postfix can all be put on. All your prefix can be put on one line, so it doesn't disrupt the the line numbering. Uh, and then you can support a decent debugging experience. Uh, if you bundle, in addition, now you've got. Um, the problem of if you if the bundle simply concatenates things into one long uh, evaluable string, uh, then you also have a uh, debugging debugging problem in correspondence with the original sources. And uh, you know one answer to that might be source maps, but I'm not um, at this. Uh, I don't yet have good comfort level with source maps. We have not tried using source maps. I don't have great reason to believe that they're working well enough. Um, so I wanted to take a look at, oh, so I, we can do any other questions or feedback on here, uh, but I wanted to take a moment to talk about uh, Markham's proposal, which is a different proposal also based on code generation. Um, I guess one more, th one uh, thing I would like to highlight here is some of the limitations. Um, so the security is relying on the static analysis, which has not been the case uh, with other constructions. Um, it specifically were also, in addition to the static analysis of the untrusted code, we're relying on the code generation of the wrapper to be correct and achieve the sandboxing. We're still relying on CES lockdown. Um, so that's part of the security model. I know I did mention, say, potential performance improvements from using this, but the prim primary performance issue I run into is frozen typed arrays which is uh, unrelated to this change. 
Um, the it, I wrote here that the untrusted code can reduce the shim fidelity and detect sh the shim environment. Um, though now it's not obvious what uh what specifically it could do to reduce shim fidelity. Yeah, what what did you have in mind there? I I don't know. I don't think that's true anymore. I um uh, I, did, I did see somewhere in, in, in your discussion you mentioned uh if you if you reflect on the global object, you can tell that you you're seeing accessor properties instead of data properties. That's yeah, I mean, that, that's a tremendously minor fidelity issue. Yeah. Um, I'll I'll come back and revisit this one if I if I have an idea what it's talking about. Um, so uh, we also are relying on rejecting dynamic import expressions um, mm -hmm. or or transforming them however you want to do it. Um, as this is the same as the current CES shim. Uh, oh here. Oh, so this is a, I don't know if this is a runtime fidelity issue so much as a compatibility fidelity issue. Um, but if you have a, a compartment global this with getters and setters, we cannot support that uh, behavior here uh, because, um, beca because when we set it up, uh, when we set up the free variable, um, the, we can't put a setter and getter inside this variable. Um, and so that that is uh, one of the limitations here. I think it's a minor one, but we do see if you wanted to do like the window.location equals uh, uh, URL, it won't work as it does in the browser. Well, window.location equals will work, but assigning to the free variable will be intercepted by the scoped variable and not get all the way up to the actual global assigning uh, property. Yeah. I I can see that as being minor. That's, I, I don't, I've, occasionally you'll see somebody say location equals, and then he's like, and that's obviously going to be on the window, right? <laughs> but in general actually, actually if we so if we're not doing scuttling on the global or something like that and we're not renaming or intercepting or modifying this thing we can actually just leave it as a whole and let it assign to the real location and because we, we so we can support that leaving holes in the sandbox but if we wanted to have a custom thing location setter goes through the location allow list before setting on the, the actual platform API, we would not be able to do that. Okay. Um, yeah, okay, so that was this proposal. Um, this one might, might be complementary or it's at least different. Um, and I think it's quite interesting. So it would be nice to cover this is Markham's idea. So maybe Markham, you can talk us through it and I can write yeah. code examples or you can take the screen if you prefer. No, no, you, you, you take the screen, I'm, um, I'm, I'll just talk. Um, so uh, so uh, on the fidelity issue, I'm going to start off with a conservative um, uh, design constraint, which we can relax, but the conservative design constraint that a, a shim can implement a subset of what is proposed uh, for the subset that it implements, uh, uh, it should try it should maintain fidelity. And for the places where it can't maintain fidelity, uh, i.e., the things outside the subset, uh, it should uh, fail cleanly and loudly, um, uh, as opposed to silently doing something else. Um, so. Uh, under that design constraint, um, uh, I'm going to, uh, first of all, make the assumption that uh, for the shim using the technique I'm about to explain, that the realm global this is non-extensible. 
um, as in prevent extensions, uh, and that each compartment global this uh, after the endowments are installed and installed and before code is run in the scope of the compartment, uh, that the compartment global this is frozen. Um, and uh, the reason is uh, exactly the issue we just talked about uh, in order to have multiple sources uh, be able to mention global variables and have the aliasing of the global variables to the compartment global this be accurate, uh, we already have the optimization uh, that does that when the um, uh, compartment global this is frozen, or specifically when the um, when the properties on it that we're interested in aliasing are non-writable, non-configurable data properties. Um, it still can't handle, so yeah, so that's that's a further constraint. It still can't handle, like uh, the previous discussion can't handle, uh, uh, endowed accessors on the compartment global list. Okay, so for the, let's start with the realm global list. The idea would be that the shadowing that's added to the source code, each, each source unit, uh, does, is not based on analyzing the source unit at all, not even conservatively. Uh, it's just uh, uh, shadowing all of the name, all of the property names on the realm global this. And to be completely precise, as 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 is appropriate in this domain, uh, it's not just the global this own properties, uh, and the global this object is not extensible. It has to be the entire inheritance chain, starting from the realm global this. So the realm global this itself has to be non extensible. That means that what object it inherits from is also fixed. That object in turn has to be non-extensible, et cetera, all the way up. Um, uh, and then all of the properties on that entire inheritance chain, uh, the corresponding variable names uh, need to be uh, shadowed uh, at the top of every short source unit, which you can do uh, with a prelude. And the prelude can all be on um, uh, on one line, so only the horizontal sp white space on the first line of source text is disrupted. I'm sorry, not the, uh, white space, but the the column numbers on the first line of source text are disrupted. The line numbers are kept, and then all of the column numbers on every line other than the first can also be preserved, since there's no rewriting needed. Uh, we still need the 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 same scanning of them to prohibit um, uh, dynamic, imp dynamic import and uh, haven't really thought about, uh, right, you can't make the original eval leave that in scope. And if you're not leaving the original one in scope, then you can't support direct evals. I haven't really thought about that. Uh, but basically, there's a small number of prohibitions you have to do by uh, that you can do conservatively by regex as we're doing now, uh, or you could do it accurately by parsing, uh, because the parsing still does not imply rewriting if you're content to prohibit those when you detect them. Um, uh, the thing that I find most exciting, which really surprised me as we talked about this is that, um, uh, and this isn't necessarily uh, just the case for, for, uh, this, um, uh, for this technique. It's also the case, I think, for the, for the technique, for the static analysis technique that uh, Kumavis presented as well, which is we could actually support the compartment, the CES compartments with modules being modules, if the modules, module source units are also prefixed with a shadowing of uh, anything that might potentially refer to the realm global this property, either by free variable analysis of the module source or by non-extensibility of the realm global this. Whichever way you, you, you come up with the variable list, 
if you just shadow all of them at the top of the module. And at first I thought, well, you can't do that because then um, you can't put the module source text within curlies because you can't nest export and import. But then I realized you don't need to put them in curlies because simply a you know, const window equals undefined at the top of the module source text without followed by a curly will still shadow the global because that's the way the module scope works. It's, that's you know, distinct from um, uh, the evaluable script global scope. Um, uh, you know, an evaluable scripts, a top level function or a top level var uh, is still aliased against the global scope. Whereas with the module, a top level declaration is just within the module and, and, and shadows uh, uh, any, any global of the same name. Um, so uh, I think, oh, and then the reason for the, um, I think I already said it, the reason for the compartment global being frozen is to avoid the, um, uh, the, uh, the issue of assignable global variables uh, alias to, glo to compartment global this properties, uh, if they're assignable, since you, we can't trigger activity on assignment, we can't know what assignment happened last, and therefore the getter on the global variable can't know what registered variable to read to reflect the last assignment. Okay, I think that's the entirety of my proposal. Uh, so in, in a situation where we have the following properties on the global list, um, I guess, I guess this, since this is not there, I've enumerated it. Um, so we would do this for ABC, XYZ and IJK, presume. Yes, we don't need to explicitly sign them. Uh, undefined, right? So, th so these, uh, sorry, the, the so global, so ABC, XYZ, and IJK would are presumed to be properties on the realm global, correct? Yeah. So you, so you do that on the outside, um, um, uh, so that uh, so to prevent accessing any of those properties on the realm global. Um. I suppose that the module would be able, they'd be able to, to detect if the variable was defined. Yes, it can, you, so the type of, the, the, the fidelity of type of, and the fidelity of use of a free variable, reading a free variable that's gen, genuinely unbound, throwing a reference error. Uh, whereas the type of, of a free variable not throwing a reference error, um, uh, that whole complex, uh, we haven't been able to preserve fidelity with that with the current session either. Uh, we would not be able to per preserve that fidelity again here. And the way in which we, we would lose fidelity is the type of would still give the accurate answer, which is the string undefined, but it would give the string undefined for the wrong reason. Um, uh, the reading, uh, but I think that's what the current session does as well. Uh, and uh, the loss of fidelity is the use of a genuinely undefined variable name as a, uh, as a variable name expression uh, would not throw a type error, a re reference error. And I think that that's just some, I think, experience has shown that we don't care, that that's, uh, there's essentially no code that we've come across that needs that to be a reference error as opposed to reading undefined. Oh yeah, one, um, I think one key thing here for, uh, from my perspective where I'm, you know, like, 
building an application bundle and I'm doing this code generation ahead of time and it's running later is that I don't have access to the global this that this is going to run on. And so I can't do the code generation ahead of time. Uh, or I, uh, yeah, I, I need to know what's on the global list and I don't wow. know it. I'm, oh, that's a good, that's, yeah, I, I, uh, okay. That's a, I hadn't seen that one coming, but you're correct. Um, my non-extensible global this assumes, of course, that at the time you're generating the source text, that you know what those names are. Actually, it suffices to have a conservative estimate of what those names are. It can include more names than are on the actual global this. And then uh, at runtime, you could start by verifying that the actual realm global this has no names that you did not anticipate. That would be fine. So still, still weirdly restrictive, but it would work. Yeah, it wouldn't be strong against like an extension injecting a global. Well, it would be a, strong. A browser sense, extension. It, it would be strong against it in the sense that it would detect it and refuse to run. Mm. Which is, you know, within the uh, design constraint of um, preserve fidelity or fail loudly, uh, but it's certainly still within that design constraint in a painful manner. Yeah, that makes sense. That that is, yeah, just fail failure, failure to boot when new web APIs are added, is um, a hard pill to swallow. Yeah, uh, I agree. I agree. Oh, 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 oh! This is tremendously weird. Um. The when the sources are fetched, the is there any way to have the the you know the the the, the fetching of them include like HTTP headers that enumerate all of the properties of the realm global this. So the server serving the sources <laughs> can do the, the rewriting on the fly in response to the, uh, to the fetching. It's probably much more trouble than it's worth. Um might be a small price to pay for performance that's interesting yeah i mean that sounds practical okay it's a, it's such a small amount of such small amount and simple code generation yeah yeah the other thing is when we're not seeking any valless environment we're just seeking a withless environment then doing the rewrite at the target, uh, you know, at, on the platform itself, rather than doing the rewrite ahead of time, is perfectly fine. Right. So Hermes is not evalless; yeah, it's yeah. just withless. Uh, correct. Yeah, and it has a proxy as well. Um, okay, so for in this situation, how are we handling compartment global this properties? Are we we just doing it? Um... So we're handling the compartment global this properties, uh, assuming that the compartment global this is frozen. So okay, let's take the Hermes. Let's take specifically the Hermes case. So we don't need to worry about 
rewriting ahead of time. We just we want to just rewrite um, uh, on the platform itself, but we would like to not parse, especially since we're doing it on the platform itself. Um, so in that case, uh, the rewriter would take a look at the realm global this and the compartment global this. Uh, um, for the, uh, it, it would do the shadowing uh, with that, the prefix you show at the top of the screen only for properties on the realm global this that are not on the compartment global this. And then it would do the, the, um, the uh, const declarations uh, to initialize the compartment global this alias variables uh, just using their values after verifying that all of the properties on the compartment global this are um, non-configurable, non-writable data properties. And then we could consider allowing loss of fidelity if we're okay with um, the compartment global this um, uh, having uh, writable or configurable or accessor properties uh, and, and letting the variable aliases um, uh, differ from the uh, properties um, uh, 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 in the various ways that we, you know, that we can't work around by, by doing the accessor trick that you've, that you've shown. Uh, okay, yeah, I think this is a problem I have in this model as well, uh, or at least this is a scope. This is maybe the scope fidelity, the the shim fidelity issue is the, because I, I didn't enumerate a requirement of uh, frozen for the compartment global this is. Mm -hmm. So I'm allowing the properties to be, uh, uh, as you can assign to them. However, I think the issue is that it I guess can you, you can make them writable but non-configurable and then because um, I'm like if you took the global this and you defined a property on it that overrode one of these then you would break the linkage between the free variable XYZ and this variable XYZ. That, that's why I suggested uh, making the global this a proxy object that traps uh, defined property. Hmm. Uh, I'm, I'm, I not, so the, 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 the threat that I'm, the, the, the case that I don't know how to do is multiple source units, each of which were you know, re, re, rewritten knowledgeably, but, but without parsing. So no, knowledgeably of the runtime environment, not knowledgeably of what the sources say, uh, uh, both of which have an assignment to the same compartment global variable. Uh, that's that's the one where I just I, I don't see any way to solve that one. But we could decide that you know let's say maybe with an option to allow that loss of fidelity, and to say that um, you know if code you know that that the the code that we're allowing um, uh, is one where there can be multiple readers of a um, of a compartment global variable, but uh, only at most one writer, uh, and that the writer has to be registered. Um, right, the right, the writer, uh, both the you know the, you need the accessor needs to know about all of the the variables that are declared as read aliases, and needs to know about the one variable that's the read write alias. And uh, if it does that, then um, no, 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 that's not correct. That's still not correct. 
because you can't update the read aliases simply on assignment to the read write alias uh, because that's not that still doesn't trigger activity. Um, so I, th I think that that um, the loss of as soon as you allow multiple mentions of the same global variable uh, by multiple source units, that uh, either that variable, that pro the property has to be non non-writable, non-configurable data property, or you have to decide to um, tolerate the loss of fidelity. And we can certainly enable the, you know, the programmer to explicitly say where they're willing to tolerate loss of fidelity. You, you could set it up, uh, you could set up your multiple uh, compartment evaluations, assuming you know them ahead of time, like this, right? If you, you, you mean by putting them all into one source unit? Yes, I suppose so. Yeah, so the, the reason why I just want to avoid that is just the debugging experience. I just really want the source unit to be one-to-one -to, -one to the source unit that's executing, uh, except for the first one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's... I mean, it's really the, 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 the loss of fidelity of the source text in the debugging experience has just been so much incredibly more painful than I had any idea it would be. Yeah, uh, and source maps are not an acceptable solution I for don't, that? I don't know. We haven't tried source maps. I'm nervous about them. I don't know how well supported they are across platforms, but they might be fine. I just don't know. Yeah, I think that source maps are pretty widely distributed, except on exotic platforms like Access, um, which is to say the lack of source map support is most likely to hurt us at Agoric, but not much else and very few other people. What really, the, the trouble with source maps is that, that they are um, useful to attackers. <laughs> and, and because they're useful to attackers, it's useful to disable them if you can, in your, uh, if you're editing something or reviewing something in a, in a modern debugger. Um, so it's a, a bit of a tricky situation. Yeah. From the, from the like bundle perspective, you know, I'm already, uh, concatenating my modules into a single source. And, um, when I've tried not doing that for large projects and having like one module per file, it is prohibitively slow. Um, so using ESM as it was specified with the ecosystem we have now is a, is a non-starter. So, let, let, so let, let me understand why it's slow. Uh, is it slow because it's fetches? Um, uh, if hypo, uh, or, and, and that the, the point of the bundling is to make sure that all of the sources get fetched into the, um, the, the, the target platform with one fetch, or is it that uh, you know what? I, because what I, I would love to do is to just preserve the modules as separate module texts, but um, uh, you know the but have you know have some kind of of bundling that doesn't concatenate the texts. Um, uh, which, but still... which, which describes, yeah, that describes the import map, like a fully descriptive import map. map. So the question, Aaron, is have you tried import maps? And if there were import maps available... Um, so well, I didn't could... try import maps, but I did try loading them flat instead of loading them as a tree. Um, this I was actually working with common JS modules with my own bundle runtime. So I wasn't using ESM, uh, but I was using thousands of small modules and loaded, you know, flat and on the same machine, you know, loaded locally. And it was it was too slow. 
Um, Do you know why? I think it's doing work in series. Um, I don't know. I, I don't know why. I think there's just too much like back and forth, even though it's on the same machine. Um, I should try it with a compartment map to see if they actually squeeze some performance out of it. But moving well, from... Uh, yeah, rather an import map, which is what... Yeah, an import map. Thank you. Yeah. We, we should also look into generating an import map from a compartment map if we need to. Yeah, um, I think just moving from thousands of files to seven files was a big difference for the browser. So, yeah, I, co I completely, well, I'm completely on board with minimizing the number of files um, and you know, putting lots and lots of modules together into a very small number of files. Uh, I would just like to not lose the module boundaries when doing that. Yeah, what's a module boundary in this context? Well, something that the um, you know that the debugger sees as a separate source unit. So you know, distingu I'm distinguishing source unit from file. Right, I want to be able to put lots and lots of source units into a single file so that they all get transferred to the browser in one fetch. The source URL, I mean, there's source map for that, but source URL does it um, work? To have one per function, or no, you can't. No, first URL is for eval. It's for eval, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. You, so you get uh, we, when you use eval, you have more options for working with source maps than than just laying it bare in the source. I mean, it, it, it sounds like a a way of putting things together where you can use eval to create this uh, scope. And the source URL in it, or source maps for places that actually support source maps. You've just described what nested eval is supposed to be. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and the only and and that works fine for Hermes as uh, because um, uh, because Hermes still has eval, it just doesn't have width. Um, uh, it it's it still it still means that. You're only dealing with evaluable text, so it still means that you you you're on you still have a problem with ESM modules. You'd have to turn them into evaluable text. Um, I think we just need to ask uh, Modable to implement source maps. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, most likely. Does anybody here have experience actually doing debugging through source maps on any other platform? Oh yeah, I mean in Chrome it's great. You just okay. see uh, you just see the original source file, uh, and then it automatically maps what's evaluated and shows shows it in the in the in the, the original source file. And the way I believe it works is basically it's just a map of character uh, positions mostly. So it okay. says like the what appears here in the evaluated code was here in this uh, original source. Yeah, the source maps are outrageously verbose, but it's fine because you don't download them unless your debugger window is open. And, and the so thing is that if we do light transforms, it's very likely the source map itself can be kept very terse. Okay, so when we ask Babel to destroy all of our horizontal white space, or excuse me, when Babel destroys all of our horizontal white space, whether we like it or not, uh, can we at least ask Babel to account for its damage by generating an accurate source map? Yeah, it does that by default. Okay. Yeah, yeah um, that... actually, if if uh, let's see if I can demo this, uh, but the 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 calculator um, is is working with source maps, I believe, um, because gosh, I don't know how I'm going to get a debugger where I want it. 
when I was debugging this, I was seeing this the source modules mapped uh, inside the calculator. I'm pretty sure. Am I hallucinating? I think you might have been. I don't know how that would be possible. But it depends on. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I, don't, I, I don't. The 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 problem the the problem is that we need to have you need to explicitly add the source map URL at the bottom, and if it's going into a zip file, it's not clear what the URL ought to be, um, since the contents of the zip file are not mapped onto a URL. Um, but when you, yeah, if if you mount Aaron. it onto URL and transform it so that it does have a source map, then then it's fine. Yeah, Aaron, if you were talking about the file names that you see in the browser on the right, yeah, then that's source URL and it's not the source map at all. I don't know. I think what I'm trying, um, I think this isn't working because I'm saving it inside of a zip file <laughs> and mm -hmm. this is not a real offering system. Uh, yeah, so I guess I'm just seeing, I'm seeing the source that's in these modules with the name i'm not necessarily seeing the original source so in cases where i transform the source um, i would be seeing the transform source yeah the okay. source url is preserved inside of those individual bunk doors which helps a lot i'm sure so i think that even without xs supporting source maps I'm just, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm gonna to change topics for just a moment. It's co obviously close related, closely related. Um, uh, so XS implements compartments, which are uh, attempting to converge on the compartments we're specifying. Um, uh, and those compartments already load modules with, with you know, uh, import hooks or something. Um, and, Therefore, we we could be using we aren't, but we could be using the excess native compartments to avoid transforming our ESM modules at all. Um, and then the other place where we run our code under debuggers is um, uh, under Node. In particular, when we're doing unit testing, we generally run under Node, and if that plus VS code supports source maps well, then if we had the Babel destruction of our sources generate source maps for use when we're debugging our code as run by node rather than as run by XS, that means we might be able to support a good debugging experience already on both. Does that sound plausible? Perhaps uh, the something to know is that um, modules compartment import of modules can only be done with the head of time comp compilation of the modules. It doesn't do runtime compilation of modules. Oh really? no! Are it you sure? They, they implemented that. They implemented that. Oh, so mm -hmm. they have source module records. Yeah, yeah, they do. Okay. Oh, Good. very That's nice. Okay. I was so scared. Yeah, so I good. wasn't aware how far they were. Yeah, they, they they took it pretty far. They disabled it for a while too because they found um it was a bug bug nest, um but uh, but the, the but with fuzzing they I think that they addressed all of the issues that they found in there. What what happened was that you know, exposing virtual module sources. Oh, that's what it was. They they implemented virtual module sources and then disabled it because the fuzzer was discovering not problems because of virtual modules. But because the fuzzer was able to find bugs in their linker that were not expressible <laughs> before, <laughs> um, and then, uh, but they, they, I think that they addressed all of the issues that the that the fuzzer was finding and re-enabled the feature. But I did get we we did get an email from them suggesting that virtual module sources, um, that we should tread carefully on that because there, there are probably bugs in existing linkers and other runtimes that are just 
haven't been explored because there's no way to write a fuzz that exercises those link errors. Okay, and the only reason we need virtual module sources uh, for now would be for common JS modules, is that correct? That is correct. Which is to say that we do have the political will to drive them because a lot of TC39 is very interested in solving the common JS problem. The, the problem of migrating from common JS to ESM is on a lot of delegates' minds. Yeah, well, I mean, clearly there Modable's intending to implement it is just holding back on it until they feel like they've they've gotten the bugs worked out. So oh, it's not even that. They they've already released it and it's it's out. Um, oh, okay. And they it's yeah. For, as far as they're concerned, they have a working prototype. And, okay. Okay. Um, so, but okay. but they caution because that we are going to definitely meet resistance from other engine implementers because they know that there are dead bodies and, and that this feature would reveal them. <laughs> um, yeah. So like, like we, we can expect some knee-jerk hesitation from V8 and JSC. Um, all right. Yeah, that's a meeting, I think. I'm gonna I'm gonna touch the record button. <laughs>